So um, thank you very much for inviting me to give a presentation today. So when we think of the big water reservoirs on land, so the terrestrial water reservoirs, we tend to only think of surface water in the forms of lakes and rivers and subsurface water residing in spaces in uh, sedimentary grains and things like that. But this is actually a big oversimplification. And although the underlying Precambrian crystalline basement is typically considered to be dry, um, uh, it turns out it can actually hold up to 30% of the groundwater inventory or some 8.5 million cubic kilometers held in cracks or fractures in the rock itself. And furthermore, we also know that these types of fluids can remain isolated for much longer timescales. And um, these longer residence times means that these fluids typically exist outside of the modern hydrogeologic cycle. And this allows them to react with the host rock over extended geologic timescales. And this results in common global characteristics in these types of fluid, such as being extremely saline, with salinity is reaching up to 200 grams per litre or more, um, and the salinity of which tends to consist mainly of calcium sodium chlorine type brines. And along with these brines, they also tend to have a high trace metal content. But that's not all. Associated with these um, fluids also tends to be a significant dissolved gas component. And this dissolved gas component is typically rich in radiogenic noble gases, as well as uh, reduced carbon-rich gases such as methane, ethane, propane, and other simple hydrocarbons, along with um, hydrogen. And this part is important because hydrogen-rich fluids can act as potential electron donors, and this is important for sustaining long-term biogeochemical reactions. However, um, despite the, these carbon-rich environments being present globally, a lot is still not known in terms of the range of residence times of the fluids, the origin of these fluids, so where they actually came from to start with, and the complex geochemical over, uh, evolution over time. Fortunately, though, we have the noble gases, at least, to, to constrain the residence time, so how long the fluids have physically been trapped in these environments. And the way we do this is um, by um, knowing that over time, uranium, thorium, and potassium in the host rock decay to produce key isotopes of helium, neon, argon, and um, xenon. So by combining measurements of uranium, thorium, and potassium in the host rock, and measuring the concentration of these radiogenic noble isotopes in the fluids, we can um, use a simple parent-daughter relationship to determine how long these fluids have been isolated for. And this is crucial for understanding the rate and extent of in situ geochemical reactions that are occurring. And indeed, using this approach, our research group, along with um, other groups um, headed by T.C. Onstott and Esther Van Heerden, have, in, um, have identified water can be trapped in these environments across quite a wide spectrum. So on the tail end, you can have fluids isolated for only thousands of years through to other mines, through other locations where fluids can, be, um, uh, fluids can reside for millions of years, and even up to one significant, um, so one location where fluids have been um, identified as having residence time in the billion years. And this is far older than anyone had previously thought possible. Therefore, through noble gases, we can determine the overall residence times of these fluids, which is crucial for understanding the rate and extent of in situ geochemical reactions. But you know, that's not actually all that the noble gases can tell us. They can also reveal information about the evolving atmosphere. And if we take xenon as an example, initially, um, atmospheric xenon ratios, um, well, the light type um, isotopes um, of xenon were thought to have an excess relative to modern air. So we have an excess here, and here is our modern day values. And this excess is thought to have reduced over time, obviously, to what we see today in the atmosphere. But the mechanisms, the rates, and the timings of this evolution are not well defined. And this limits its use as an independent tracer for constraining atmospheric evolution. And previously, the only way to constrain any atmospheric evolution for xenon was uh, by using fluid inclusion data. But now, the spectrum of residence times as preserved in these fracture fluids can actually provide additional insight. And in the oldest systems that we identified, we have actually been able to identify a remnant Archean atmospheric component, allowing further insight into the evolution of the atmosphere over deep time. But we are not only interested in just the geochemistry, though. Uh, through seven, several direct and indirect lines of evidence, we have recently, well, 
our, our, ourselves and other teams have, have been able to identify that despite the challenges of temperature, pressure and salinity, life can be sustained in these environments. But our current understanding of this life is actually rather basic, and the race therefore is now on to understand it. And work is needed on understanding the range, distribution and age of these communities, and we also need to understand the potential effects on the geochemistry of the deep, and perhaps of most relevance to quite a few people in this room, we also need to understand what the role these deep um, microbiological communities might have in terms of the deep crustal carbon cycle. But if we take a step back for a moment, there are clear implications to research in these environments beyond Earth as well. And if we take Mars as an example, though the surface is currently considered dry, the subsurface still has the potential to contain liquid water, perhaps also in long isolated subsurface fractures. And the importance of this has not gone unnoticed. In, in fact, the National Academy of Science published a report just this year which focused on the search for life elsewhere in the universe. And in light of this research into the deep subsurface, they strongly recommended the following. NASA's programs should now reflect a dedicated focus on research and exploration of subsurface habitability in light of recent advances demonstrating the breadth and diversity of life in Earth's subsurface. And with that, I think I'll leave it there. Many thanks for your time.